Good morning, YouTubers. Recently, I came across an article discussing the names and identities of the past few generations. The greatest generation got their name because they defeated the Nazis in World War II. The baby boomers were named because of the post-World War II baby boom. Generation X were born starting in the early 1960s and ending in the early 1980s. Generation Y, commonly referred to as Millennials, were born in the early 1980s through the early 2000s. Wait, hold on a minute. That's kind of a big gap to group all those people together. I mean, yes, it's no more of a time frame compared to previous generations, but I find it hard to believe that someone born in 1983 has more in common with someone born in 1999 than they would with someone born in 1977. Apparently, I'm not the only one who observed that either, to a point that there's been articles arguing for classifying those born between 1977 and 1983 as... Exennials? Really? That's the name they propose? Well, that strange name aside, the argument has some validity. Those born during those six years contain an array of both Gen Xers and Millennials. Some propose referring to this group as the Star Wars generation, because of the years the original Star Wars films were released. These were also the years where several companies fought for dominance in the video game industry. Magnavox, Fairchild, RCA, Atari, Mattel, and Coleco all fought to have their gaming consoles reign supreme from 1977 through 1983. Yet none of these still existing companies continue to make consoles. In terms of technology and experiences, I think someone born in 1983 had considerably different experiences growing up in the 80s than someone born in 1999. I just recently discussed the story of Ralph Baer and the Magnavox Odyssey. If you haven't already seen that video, I went into detail about not just the origins of Bear, but the aftermath the Odyssey left, in terms of Atari and Pong. To fully understand how any home computer or gaming console works, we have to take a look at what makes a computer so small. I mean compared to the computers of the 1950s and 60s that took up entire rooms. When what we would call computers began appearing in research labs and college campuses, their processing power was managed by vacuum tubes very much like how radios and televisions of the time operated. In their most basic form, vacuum tubes work by taking an extra electrode housed inside a bulb, heating the filament, causing electrons to boil off its surface and into the vacuum housed inside the bulb. A direct current actually flows through the vacuum if that extra electrode is made more positive than the filament. Since the temperatures of the extra electrode and filament vary from cold to hot, the direct current can only flow in a single direction from the filament to the electrode. Now, if we set up a nearby target of positive electricity, the electrons which escape from the surface of the wire are pulled directly to the plate. Actually, however, the space between the wire and plate is jam-packed with gyrating air atoms, literally billions of them. And to reach the plate, the electrons would have to bump their way through them like midgets in a subway crowd. Whoa, Nate, you cut his mic off, right? It's off. He's not going to talk anymore? Good. Just uh, don't turn his mic on for the rest of the episode. Just let that time traveler guy from 1940 still think he's on air. Anyway, I'm shocked and appalled by that guy's derogatory language referring to little people. We cannot condone that use of the word in any way. I'm sure you people understand. You people? Did you hear that, Marcus? He said you people. You people. Who the hell is us people? In 1873, a British physicist and chemist named Frederick Guthrie discovered this technique when he observed a positively charged electroscope discharging after a grounded piece of white hot metal was brought near the electroscope. The technique only worked if the electroscopes were not close enough for them to touch. Guthrie noted that they seemed to only apply to positively charged electroscopes, not negatively charged ones. This implied the flow of electric current was only possible in a single direction. Reportedly, Thomas Edison independently rediscovered this fact seven years later. But considering Edison is accused of independently rediscovering a number of different inventions after various people invented them, you can believe what you want. During the 1940s, numerous companies experimented with new technologies to improve upon the highly fragile radio and television tubes commonly used at the time. What eventually got developed was the transistor. This is essentially a semiconductor that either amplified or increased power to the device it was installed in. Because of a transistor's small size, compared to vacuum tubes, this made a number of electronic devices not only more powerful than ever before, but smaller in size than ever before. By the late 1960s, the computer and electronics industries were yet again on the verge of another breakthrough. 
computers operate on integrated circuits that contain anywhere from a dozen to several hundred transistors. During the Apollo space program, NASA used custom-built processors they dubbed the Apollo Guidance Computer. The Apollo Guidance Computer actually used over 4,000 integrated circuits that each contained a single 3-input NOR gate, which is just a digital logic gate that performs a specific function. When it comes to the mathematics used, it's a bit over my head, so I'll stop there. But while your smartphone may be more powerful than the Apollo 11 space module, just remember that you probably still want to use that same primitive technology implemented by NASA. Unlike the Apollo computer system, if one component fails in your smartphone, you have to reset the entire device, compared to the Apollo 11 module, where every system worked independently. That, on top of the fact that smartphones aren't yet built to withstand radiation exposure while traveling through the Van Allen belt, compared to the NASA computers both then and now, wouldn't make your smartphone ideal to use while traveling to the moon. Here is a photograph of a printed circuit board from a digital computer, a la 1960. Prehistoric. During the 1960s, a number of different companies were working on improving transistors in an attempt to make them more powerful and efficient. In 1968, the U.S. Navy began development of the flight control computer for their state-of-the-art F-14 Tomcat fighter jet. One of the companies competing for the contract at producing this new computer system was Garrett Air Research, a manufacturer of turboprop engines and turbochargers. They had previously produced successful computer systems for the Department of Defense. So they were no strangers to this type of work, but what was required was a bit different than any other computer system used by the Navy. Led by Steve Geller and Ray Holt, Garrett Air Research delivered in 1970 a central air data computer using what is considered to be one of the first ever microprocessors. To put it lightly, the development of the microprocessor became a true game changer. Compared to the mechanical systems previously used in fighter jets, this microprocessor was a fraction of the size of its predecessors, not to mention performed considerably better. This 20-bit NP944 central air data computer was used in the vast majority of F-14 Tomcats and was actually only declassified in 1997. The NP944 contained six chips, all based on a 20-bit fixed-point fraction two's complement number system. I actually have no idea what that means, other than something related to binary mathematical operations. And I won't lie to you, this mission will be dangerous. Uh, would you say we'd be venturing into a zone of danger? Well, yes, obviously. No, but I mean, how would you phrase that? I... the zone will be one of danger? No, I mean, not if you'd say the thing to... forget it, never mind. And you never mind and also shut up. During the same time, other companies began researching and developing microprocessors. Lee Boisel designed the four-phase systems AL1 which was an 8-bit bit slice chip. No, I did not just stutter. That contained eight registers along with an ALU. This particular microprocessor was used as part of a nine-chip, 24-bit CPU. Pico Electronics and General Instrument joined forces to produce a single-chip calculator integrated circuit that many believe was the first to utilize ROM, RAM, and risk construction set on chip. If steel refining was the single most important invention of the 19th century, because of the world it helped build, then the microprocessor is the single most important invention of the 20th century for the same reason. And the microprocessor that is credited with revolutionizing the world as a whole is largely considered to be the Intel 4004. In April of 1970, an Italian immigrant named Federico Fagan began working at Intel. A decade earlier in Italy, Fagan co-designed a small digital transistor computer equipped with four kilobytes of memory. While still in Italy during the 1960s, Fagan studied physics and taught electronics to physics students at the University of Padua. In 1967, he began working for SGS Fairchild, where he developed their first metal oxide semiconductor metal gate process technology, more commonly known as MOS. He also developed SGS Fairchild's first couple of commercially integrated circuits corresponding to this MOS metal gate process technology. Prehistoric. After the Fairchild part of SGS Fairchild sold his holdings, Fagan accepted a job offer in February of 1968 to assist in the development of the Silicon Gate technology in California. While there, Fagan became a pivotal part of completing this new technology that modern N-type and complementary metal oxide semiconductors integrated circuits would be based. When Intel brought Fagan on board in 1970, they were well aware of his work and tasked him with leading the team that would create what would eventually be the first commercially available microprocessor. 
Within nine months of Fagan joining Intel, his team had completed development of what would be the Intel 4004. By March of 1971, this revolutionary piece of technology was put on the market for just $60. Adjusted for inflation 2018, that's roughly around $370. Specification-wise, the 4004 contained 2300 transistors and has CPU that clocked in at 740 kilohertz. These days, that doesn't sound like much, but in 1971, it was state-of-the-art. The 4004 and its successors would be what computer and electronic manufacturers would use in many of their own products, and Atari was no different. Starting in the 1970s, desktop computers began to appear in homes and offices across parts of the Western world. Remember Fairchild? Little did anyone at Atari anticipate the business that previously built microprocessors would put on some gloves and fight for a share of the video game industry. In the early and mid-1970s, Atari had begun to corner the video game market with arcade games that, unlike the competing Magnavox Odyssey, didn't use a BIOS or operating system to function. Atari programmed custom circuit boards that contained no BIOS or operating system to work. Even the sounds Atari's games featured utilized the chips in the circuit boards. Around this time, Atari began the steps towards developing a home video game console in an effort to directly compete with Magnavox and what was their upcoming Odyssey 2 home console. But like many industries, especially new ones, there was going to be a fight for the home video game market. In 1974, Wallace Kirshner and Lawrence Haskell were working for American Machine and Foundry, which was actually a bowling alley equipment manufacturer and operator of bowling alleys. Before getting involved in the bowling industry, AMF actually had government contracts for building nuclear reactors. Kirshner and Haskell got involved with, wait a minute, what did I just say? In 1974, Wallace Kirshner and Lawrence Haskell were working for American Machine and Foundry, which was actually a bowling alley equipment manufacturer and operator of bowling alleys. Before getting involved in the bowling industry, AMF actually had government contracts for building nuclear reactors. That's what I thought I just said, is that right? So you're telling me that they went from building nuclear reactors, then to bowling equipment, then to video games? How does that happen? I actually don't have the patience to find out. Let's just stick to their video game venture. In 1974, Kirshner and Haskell got involved with video games because they saw what Atari and Magnavox were doing and thought their employer, AMF, should throw their hat in the ring as well. One advantage Kirshner had was the idea of using microprocessors and software to create more complex games. Similar in a way to the Odyssey, Kirshner's idea was to utilize interchangeable cartridges to activate the various games. Kirshner and Haskell dubbed their new project Raven, or Remote Access Video Entertainment. To develop their prototype, the duo would take advantage of the Intel 8008 microprocessor, the successor to the 4004. Because of the high cost of computer memory at the time, each cartridge needed to be under 2 kilobits, or 256 bytes. Some of the games Haskell ended up developing included a hockey game, a tic-tac-toe game, and even a shooting game. After developing their prototype, it became clear AMF did not have the capital required to launch a product like this. The duo then began finding a company who would invest in the Raven. One of the challenges was actually finding a company not already investing in the video game industry with their own proprietary technology. It's reported that RCA, Motorola, and even Zenith all turned them down. Kirshner and Haskell then shifted gears on who to demonstrate their prototype to. One such company was Fairchild, who was best known at the time as a developer and manufacturer of early pocket calculators, digital watches, and microprocessors. Prehistoric. After a demonstration in early 1975, Fairchild was sold on the idea of the Raven and of interchangeable cartridges. And since the Raven required microprocessors, Fairchild knew the perfect place to acquire said microprocessors, in the room next door. The first thing that Fairchild required Kirshner and Haskell to do was to replace the Raven's Intel 8008 microprocessor with one produced by Fairchild. With guidance from Fairchild engineer Jerry Lawson, they began converting the Raven with Fairchild's F8 microprocessor. They also dumped the original keyboard interface for a joystick one. The Raven was also originally renamed Stratos. In November of 1975, Fairchild projected their new console would sell over 5 million units within two years, giving them a decent chunk of this new home console market. They were probably well aware that Magnavox was about to release their Odyssey 2, and most likely predicted Atari would also jump into the home console market as well. After some more branding changes, the new console would be named the Fairchild Video Entertainment System, 
and eventually settling on simply the Fairchild Channel F. Fairchild spent 1976 perfecting the new console, finalizing the internal layout of the schematics, and figuring out how the interchangeable cartridges would exactly work. Like the jive turkeys that they were, inspiration for the cartridges came in the form of the popular music listening format of 8-track tapes. I don't expect you kids to know anything about 8-tracks. When I was growing up in the 1980s, 8-tracks were already considered arcane and out of date. Kind of like CDs now. Boy, I sound old. Dynamite! In defense of 8-track tapes, one of their biggest strengths was that they were resistant to reasonable rough handling. Just don't leave them in the car in the middle of July. The team at Fairchild designed their game cartridges to withstand a variety of things, such as static discharge and repeated insertions into the console. At the Summer Consumer Electronics Show in June of 1976, the Fairchild Channel F made its debut. Although it's reported their debut was underwhelming, due in part to no working game being on display to attract attention. But they more than made up for it with a July 6 article in Business Week magazine. The Channel F was featured in an article detailing the state of microprocessors being used in modern products. After the article's release, it became clear over at RCA that their own, lesser known Studio 2, also an interchangeable cartridge video game console, would have some competition. I wonder if RCA realized the Channel F was that Raven prototype they had rejected a year earlier. In RCA's defense, it had been confirmed that the Studio 2 was already in development by May of 1976, a month prior to Fairchild making the Channel F's public debut at CES. Fairchild released the Channel F in December of 1976, just in time for the Christmas season. The RCA Studio 2 debuted just a couple months later in February of 1977. While Fairchild might have beaten everyone to the punch with the Channel F, one lesson they learned too late was it didn't necessarily matter if you were the first to market if your game selection wasn't up to par. RCA also learned that lesson the hard way by relying on their Studio 2 game library to contain mostly educational games. By the time the RCA Studio 2 made its debut in early 1977, Atari had spent the previous five years struggling to get their own home console on the market. To help develop the next generation of game consoles, Atari purchased Scion Engineering in 1973, partially because Scion had already been developing a gaming console of their own. Stella, the prototype Scion had been working on and that Atari had then acquired through their acquisition, worked differently than the arcade machines Atari was used to producing. It housed several different microprocessors, such as the 8-bit MOS technology 6502, 6507, and 6532. Despite Atari's early success with Pong and other arcade titles, by 1976, the company was strapped for capital and Nolan Bushnell made the difficult decision to sell Atari to Warner Communications for $28 million. On the intention, the Stella prototype be perfected and released to the public before too many imitators emerged. To help get the Stella finished into market, Atari brought on board an integrated circuit engineer named Jay Miner. Miner had already been successful with his designs for a variety of medical products, such as a remote-controlled pacemaker. Miner's contribution to the Stella was enough to give Nolan Bushnell a heart attack, and joy that is. To get the Stella to communicate directly with the television, Miner devised the Television Interface Adapter, also known as the TIA chip. This addition to the Stella is how the microprocessors used in the console converted the data originated from the game cartridge into a video signal that your NTSC cathode ray tube television could read and output as the picture and sound display. The TIA chip also contains two identical yet independent audio circuits that operate simultaneously with three registers that control a noise tone generator, a frequency selection, and volume control. The noise tone generator is controlled by writing to the 4-bit audio control registers, which cause various different kinds of sounds to be emitted. The frequency is controlled by a 5-bit audio frequency register that divides a 30 kHz frequency. This is how the various low and high pitched sounds are generated. The volume is controlled by a 4-bit audio volume register, where programmers would manipulate by writing command values from 0 all the way to 15. The 6532 peripheral interface adapter chip, which Atari referred to simply as the PIA chip, performed three necessary functions. It provided 128 bytes of RAM, a programmable timer, and two 8-bit parallel I.O. ports, also known as in-and-out ports. One technological issue Atari had to deal with involved adapting the Stella for PAL and CCAM television signals. In 1930, the Republican-controlled House of Representatives, in an effort to alleviate the effects of the... Anyone? Anyone? The Great Depression, passed the... Anyone? Anyone? 
a tariff bill, the Hawley Smoot Tariff Act, which anyone raised or lowered, raised tariffs in an effort to collect more revenue for the federal government. Did it work? Anyone? Anyone know the effects? It did not work, and the United States sank deeper into the Great Depression. Today, we have a similar debate over this. Anyone know what this is, class? Anyone? If you haven't already, check out my light gun video on the difference between NTSC and PAL. One detail Atari couldn't overlook while converting games to a PAL signal was the difference in audio frequency. NTSC emits sounds at 60 Hz, while PAL emits sounds at 50 Hz. This may not seem like a big difference, but if overlooked in the conversion, the gameplay for PAL televisions will slow the video down by 17%. This has to do with both the difference in frames per second and the scan lines used by each video signal. Atari resolved this issue by programming games with 2-byte fractional techniques to move various objects in the games. By using this method and not programming based on frames per second, converting their games became as simple as just changing the various fraction tables used in the game's code. When it comes to the CCAM version of the console, nothing needed to be changed in regards to the audio conversion from NTSC. However, the CCAM video signal reads the color commands differently than PAL does. I'm not going to dive deep into that detail, but it was something Atari was aware of when programming their games. After Warner Communications acquired Atari, they chose to rebrand their upcoming Stella project into the Atari Video Computer System, or VCS. Today, it's better known as the Atari 2600. Sunnyvale, California served as the manufacturing headquarters for the first units. The early editions actually had six switches on the front. Because of the weight these switches added, the first line of consoles were unofficially dubbed heavy fixers. Starting in 1978, the manufacturing was moved to Hong Kong. The Atari 2600 officially debuted in North America on September 11, 1977 with a $200 price tag. Adjusted for inflation in 2018, that's over $800. Of the 800,000 consoles manufactured, Atari was only able to sell a little over half a million of them. Because of the shortfall, Warner had to cover the financial loss of the unsold units. This served as a major factor in Nolan Bushnell leaving Atari in 1978. By this point, Fairchild had failed to sell more than half of what Atari had even sold, despite Fairchild's being $30 cheaper and first to market. In 1979, Zircon International purchased the rights of the Channel F and redesigned it as the Channel F System 2. Nick Tellsford, the original Channel F designer at Fairchild, also designed the System 2. While the intention was to be more competitive with the 2600, the System 2 only released six games before throwing in the towel. However, the original Channel F remained on the market. By Christmas of 1979, Atari bounced back and sold more than a million additional units that year. At this point, you'd think anyone going up against Atari and the video game market would have to have huge balls just for even thinking they could capture the majority of the market. But, out of nowhere, the company with balls big enough to even try was known much more for their line of anatomically incorrect toys. Just like all their competitors, Mattel had already begun developing a home video game console of their own in 1977. By 1980, they had failed to even get anything to market, missing out on the huge opportunity that Atari capitalized on. When development began in 1977, Mattel wanted to compete against Atari and Fairchild by having a more advanced gaming system. David Chandler at Mattel began the engineering work related to what would be the Intellivision. The first choice for a chipset originated from National Semiconductor, who was offering a new, yet expensive set of chips. Mattel's consultant firm, APH Technological Consulting, instead recommended a chipset provided by General Instrument. Originally, the chipset offered by General Instrument didn't cater to Mattel's needs, which included being able to reprogram graphics. General Instrument was eager to get their business, so they soon developed a chipset that catered to Mattel's needs. In a partnership with Honeywell, General Instrument delivered the CP1600, a 16-bit microprocessor. To process sound, Mattel used the AY38910, also supplied by General Instrument. This was a three-voice programmable sound generator that, when compared to the Atari 2600, produced better quality sounds. David Roth from their consulting firm, APH Technological, developed their executive control software, and with the help of interns provided by Caltech, designed and programmed the first games. David James at Mattel led the graphics design team. Wow, three Davids. That must have gotten confusing. While the Intellivision contained only 4K ROM, it was actually able to make the game appear to be 8K. They did this by utilizing the software running the Intellivision, which ran games at only a 20Hz frame rate, compared to a 60Hz frame rate that the Intellivision was equipped for. The first games released were all developed at APH Technological Consulting. Soon after the Intellivision began catching on with consumers, game development was moved back to Mattel headquarters. 
Mattel ended up hiring so many necessary programmers that they soon moved their whole electronics division to a much larger facility. This location and the programmers' identities even were kept a closely guarded secret by Mattel. This was due to the fear of Atari poaching them away. While not as secretive, Atari and other companies making video games at the time deliberately prevented programmers from taking credit publicly for their games. Although a handful did find ways around this by sneaking credit in that players could see after unlocking certain parts of the game. Mattel's programmers referred to themselves as the Blue Sky Rangers, derived from their brainstorming meetings, which they referred to as Blue Sky Meetings. The original five members of the Blue Sky Rangers from 1978 were Gabriel Baum, Don Daglow, Rick Levine, Mike Minkoff, and John Saul. Within five years, the group reportedly had 110 programmers working on games for the Intellivision. Not satisfied with Mattel's practice of programmers, both receiving little, if any, royalties and preventing credit for their work, many began leaving for competitors like Atari, Activision, and iMagic. Some even got together and formed their own company to develop games. By 1983, Mattel had several competing companies developing games for them, such as Parker Brothers, Sega, and even Atari themselves. Of course, when their competitors created games for them, Mattel themselves didn't receive any royalties for those games. Competitors got away with this because the practice of using lockout chips had yet to be implemented. In 1983, Intellivision owners won't believe their luck because while others are asking you to buy a completely new system, Mattel Electronics is revolutionizing Intellivision, making gameplay like this possible simply by adding a computer keyboard. Throughout the Intellivision's lifespan, a number of add-ons were released. A keyboard component converted the Intellivision into an actual computer by adding an 8-bit 6502 processor, the same one used in both the Atari 2600 and the Apple II. Mattel Electronics presents the IntelliVoice gave games an actual voice to enhance gameplay. This speech synthesizer incorporated both male and female voices as well as distinct accents. The IntelliVoice contained a General Instruments SP0256 chip that generates its speech with a sample rate of 10 kHz and 2 KB of ROM. There are only five games that utilize the IntelliVoice. After lackluster sales, Mattel discontinued it in 1983. In 1983, Mattel released a cheaper, more compact version of the Intellivision, simply called the Intellivision 2. This was not an upgrade, it was just simply a repackaged version of the Intellivision. For consumers looking for an upgrade system, Mattel had a couple of different projects already in development. Dave Chandler, one of the many Daves there at Mattel, began developing with his team of engineers a project called Decade. This console was designed to take advantage of the Motorola 68000 chip. Eventually this console was renamed the Intellivision 4. Wait, what happened to the Intellivision 3? Did they do what Microsoft did with Windows and just skip a number? No, not really. Mattel was also working on what would be called the Intellivision 3, which was a console designed to play more advanced cartridges, as well as being backwards compatible with already existing Intellivision games. Neither of these consoles would see the light of day outside of a Mattel lab. In 1982, executives at Mattel could see the market for video games had plateaued, and in their annual report that year, predicted a first quarter loss for 1983. Despite these concerns, Mattel continued to expand the electronics division both at home and abroad. In February of 1983, they opened a new office in southern France to develop games for both themselves and the ColecoVision for the European market. Around this time, the Mattel electronics division employed over 1,800 people, and that's just an electronics division. But 1983 would prove to be a fateful year not just for Mattel, but for anyone involved in the gaming industry. The summer of 1983 would serve as an indicator for how the rest of the year was going to turn out for Mattel. The presence at the Chicago Consumer Electronics Show in June unimpressed retailers to say the least. Expectations for the company were low. Mattel was losing money. A lot of money. On July 12th, the Mattel board replaced then-current electronics president Josh Denham with Mac Morris. Morris wanted to shake things up, so he brought in former Mattel electronics president Jeff Rockless as a consultant to review the division he once led. Morse decided to slash the Intellivision 2's price in less than half, from $150 to $69. Morse also canceled the not yet released Intellivision 3 and 4, as well as all new hardware projects already in development. On August 4th, Mattel laid off 660 employees from the electronics division. By October, the electronics division was experiencing losses, totaling over $280 million, and a third of the remaining programming staff were laid off later that month. A month later in November, another third got pink slips and on January 20th, 1984, those programmers lucky enough to make it that far were finally let go as well. The electronics division only remained in existence 
to allow their offices in France and Taiwan to fulfill their contractual and legal obligations. On February 4th, Mattel sold the Intellivision project for only $20 million. The corporate offices at Mattel were a bloodbath drowning in pink slips. They vowed to never get involved in the video game industry again. It wouldn't be until a chance meeting five years later with a former nuclear engineer and a dreadlock-wearing former Atari programmer would change all that. Mortal Kombat on Sega Genesis is the best video game ever. I disagree. It's a very good game, but I think Donkey Kong is the best game ever. Donkey Kong sucks. You know something? You suck. Another company that would get caught in the tsunami that was the video game crash would be the Connecticut Leather Company? Is that right? Well, Coleco, as they were better known as, was cast in the part of a Fonzie-like bad boy who shows up fashionably late to the party. Some would say too late. But being first doesn't necessarily mean being the best. Eric Bromley was an engineer who had headed up the research and development department at Midway during the 1970s. By 1981, Bromley was working at Coleco when he read an obscure article about how the cost of RAM was beginning to drop for the first time. RAM is used regularly in computers, arcades, and gaming consoles to provide the memory necessary to execute their programs. If you're watching this on a computer or a laptop, you can see how much RAM yours has by checking out the settings. Upon reading this, Bromley went to Coleco CEO Arnold Greenberg with the idea of Coleco entering the home gaming market with their own system to compete against the already successful Atari 2600 and Intellivision. But designing and developing a gaming console hadn't really been Coleco's thing. Coleco had some experience with computers and electronics. They designed a video chip for Texas Instruments and a sound chip for General Instruments. They also developed a Pong clone, the Telestar, as well as a series of handheld electronic games. But Bromley had much more experience in developing video games from his days at Midway. In an impromptu meeting, Bromley reportedly burst into Greenberg's office without so much as acknowledging the secretary out front. There, Bromley explained to Greenberg the project he wanted to do, speaking to him in a language CEOs understand far too well. Money. Bromley explained the cost analysis of producing a potential game console compared to what consumers would pay for one. After 10 minutes of a back and forth discussion, they began instinctively calling this new project ColecoVision. It was originally just supposed to be a working title, with the intention of their marketing team coming up with a better one. One key difference Bromley wanted ColecoVision to incorporate to set itself apart from the Atari 2600 and the Intellivision was having better graphics. Graphics so good, in fact, they would be compared to arcade graphics of the time. And if your console is going to be compared to arcade graphics, why not provide a successful arcade game used with it at home? When Bromley traveled to Hyoto to meet with an unknown Japanese card game company that had just recently begun getting into the video game industry themselves, he had no idea what game would best serve this purpose. What he also didn't know was by the time he left Kyoto to go back home, he was going to discover and secure the rights for what would be one of the biggest video games of all time. In late July of 1981, Donkey Kong made its American debut in arcades and quickly became extremely popular among arcade goers. Bromley knew adapting a home port of a game with that kind of following would be exactly what Atari or Mattel would do for their consoles, and he wanted to beat them to the punch. Nintendo chairman Hiroshi Yamamuchi was a skilled negotiator. He made appoint meetings to take advantage of people's travel schedules in an attempt to force their hand and agree to do something with little or no time to discuss it with others back home. Bromley knew this and planned on using it against Hiroshi to his own advantage. During the meeting, when Hiroshi inquired about Bromley's travel plans, Bromley lied and told him he actually had an earlier train to catch. But Hiroshi was full of other business tricks. Another tactic involved using a translator during meetings when in fact Hiroshi spoke fluent English. With Bromley thinking he had more time to hammer out a deal for the exclusive rights to Donkey Kong, Hiroshi pulled another ace up his sleeve. It was an ultimatum that if Coleco wanted the rights to Donkey Kong, Nintendo wanted a $2 royalty rate per cartridge. This was more than twice the highest royalty rate of 90 cents on any prior game. Hiroshi also wanted a $200,000 advance. Previously, the highest Coleco had ever paid for an advance was $5,000. Oh, one more thing. Bromley had to wire the money by midnight. Bromley didn't know if this was even possible. Hiroshi proved that despite Bromley's attempt to have the upper hand, or at least a minimal advantage, that you don't bring a knife to a samurai duel. Upon catching his actual train back to the hotel, Bromley promptly called Greenberg back in the States. With a 14-hour time zone difference, Greenberg picked up the phone at what was 3 o'clock in the morning for him. Bromley explained the ultimatum to the half-awake Greenberg. Initially, 
Greenberg wasn't impressed enough with Donkey Kong to make such a pricey deal, but Bromley argued that this game is on its way to be even bigger than Pac-Man. After thinking about it for a moment, Greenberg concedes and agrees to wire the money as soon as the banks open that day. Bromley is thrilled and thinks this is exactly the game to provide as the ColecoVision's pack-in game for its upcoming release. Initially, the contract is composed on some napkins while drinking sake at Hiroshi's office. When Bromley returns to the United States and presents this napkin to Coleco's lawyers, their expressions are about what you'd expect. What is this? What is this? Where's all the money? That's as good as money, sir. Those are IOUs. Bromley explained that this is how the Japanese do business. In reality, this napkin contract was just another move Hiroshi used against Americans ignorant enough to fall for it. Hiroshi used Howard Lincoln to draft the actual paper contract. At the time, Lincoln was working as an outside legal counsel for Nintendo of America. Seen here in a Norman Rockwell painting that he posed for as a Boy Scout, and yes, that kid right there in the painting is actually the same Howard Lincoln I am discussing. With having his client's best interest in mind, Lincoln drafted a contract that, if read closely, gives Nintendo complete immunity to any lawsuits in regards to Donkey Kong cartridges released by Coleco. Now, traditionally companies like Nintendo accept liabilities on games like this, but Lincoln didn't see how that was an advantage to his client, so he just simply admitted that from the proposed contract. Being as aggressive as the negotiator that he was, Roshi basically later slapped Bromley with the proposed contract and demanded he sign it. Bromley commented that his lawyers hadn't even read it yet. Roshi seemed unconcerned with his observation and essentially said, if you want the license, you have to sign it. So, on February 1st, 1982, Coleco and Nintendo entered into an agreement for the Donkey Kong license. Coleco paid Nintendo an undisclosed amount of money, plus agreed to royalties of $1.40 for every Donkey Kong cartridge and $1 for every tabletop version sold. $1.40 was lower than the original $2 royalty proposed, but still significantly higher than any other they had paid before. Coleco must have felt relieved to have an actual legal paper contract in hand. Just a couple weeks prior at the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas, Bromley wanted to meet up with Hiroshi to discuss and possibly finalize the not yet made contract from their earlier meeting in Kyoto. Hiroshi's daughter played the role of gatekeeper for her father there. It was from her that Bromley learned Nintendo was planning on backing out of their initial agreement with Coleco and making a deal with Atari instead. Hopefully Atari is planning on bringing some paper towels with them to the meeting. Bromley was livid after spending several hours in a hotel room trying to figure out what his next move would be, he called Hiroshi's room. He was asleep but his daughter, the gatekeeper, answered the phone. Bromley proceeded to plead with her to convince her father to cancel their new deal with Atari and stick to the originally agreed upon deal with Coleco. Miss Hiroshi was moved by Bromley's passion and agreed to discuss this with her father. Whatever was discussed after this initial phone call worked, because Hiroshi agreed to cancel their new deal with Atari and stick with the original deal he had made with Coleco. And just eight months later in August 1982, the ColecoVision debuted with a retail price of $175, or just a little over $400 in 2018, and with Donkey Kong as its pack-in game. By Christmas of that year, Coleco had sold more than half a million units and easily passed the one million unit mark by early 1983. While sales did eventually decline through 1984, the ColecoVision sold more than 2 million units before it was discontinued in 1985. From a technical standpoint, the ColecoVision came equipped with 16 kilobytes of video RAM, 1 kilobyte of RAM, and 8 kilobytes of ROM. Like many gaming consoles of the time, it also ran off of the Z80 processor. While the library of games was very similar to what both Atari and Mattel had to offer, the quality of the games is considered by many to be superior in terms of graphics and overall gameplay. But the success both Coleco and Nintendo were experiencing was in large part due to the success of Donkey Kong. Coleco would soon learn the hard way to always read the fine print of any contract before signing it. Because due to the thinking of then outside legal counsel Howard Lincoln, Nintendo was mostly immune to the lawsuit brought by a real life Hollywood giant, bigger than the fictional Donkey Kong. King Kong was originally released by RKO Pictures in 1933. The film was an instant hit at the time, and even 85 years later, it's considered one of the great classic films of the 20th century. By the time the game Donkey Kong was released in 1981, Universal Pictures owned the rights to King Kong, and after seeing Donkey Kong emerge in arcades, 
they couldn't help but see a striking resemblance to both Kongs. Not wanting the video game industry to make them look foolish, Universal filed lawsuits against both Nintendo and Coleco for copyright infringement. While Nintendo was immune from any Donkey Kong releases made by Coleco, they weren't immune from their own arcade releases. Fearing the high cost of a lawsuit of this nature, Coleco quickly made a deal with Universal for 3% of Donkey Kong sales. While like their own character Jumpman and Donkey Kong, Nintendo fights back. In court, they highlighted the numerous differences between King Kong and Donkey Kong. Manhattan District Court Judge DJ Sweet agreed with Nintendo's defense and ruled in their favor. During the appeals process, it's inadvertently discovered that Universal didn't even technically own the rights to King Kong? Oh boy, that's embarrassing. Look, look if we built this large wooden badger, at some point over the years, Universal had accidentally let the copyright for King Kong lapse, making this entire process irrelevant. By the time this information had been discovered, they were already arguing, oh, this is not good, in front of the United States Supreme Court. The Supreme Court ruled in favor of Nintendo and ordered Universal to pay Nintendo $1.8 million in damages. This resulted in Coleco filing suit against Universal getting back royalties they had already paid to Universal for a copyright they didn't even own. In fact, I'll make a deal with you. We will drop this case right now if you come over here and put your testicles right here and let me slam this door like this! Go ahead. We can settle this right now. Call it even. I will drop this case right now if you let me slam your balls in this door, because that's what happened to my client! Even during the legal mess Coleco and Nintendo were in with Universal, Atari still wanted to release their own version of Donkey Kong. After missing out on the exclusive rights at CES in 1982, Atari ultimately decided to just hire Coleco to port a version over to the 2600. Coleco accepted and actually outsourced the programming work to Wickstead Design Associates, who in turn test a programmer named Gary Kitchen to do the actual programming work. Despite its poor graphics and gameplay, this Atari version ended up selling 4 million units. Throughout 1983, the gaming industry started to shift from what was its unending rise to a downward spiral. Over the years, there's been a lot of speculation about what actually caused the video game crash of 1983. Essentially, there wasn't just one thing that caused it. There were numerous factors involved. One contributing factor was the saturation of numerous consoles and the almost identical library of games for each. Another factor was third parties could make a game on any system, both physically and legally. The physical problem will be solved in the form of a lockout chip that Nintendo implemented in 1985 and is standard today. One of the other problems Atari faced was third party developers releasing X-rated or pornographic games on their system. I need an adult! I need an adult! The lockout chip would also prevent that from ever happening again, at least in theory. If you're interested in learning a little more about that, check out my prior episode on X-rated games, but that video contains adult content not safe for work. The legal problem with third parties developing games would be solved with Tengen and their numerous legal hurdles. Father to a murdered son, husband to a murdered wife, and I will have my vengeance in this life or the next. Tengen was basically Atari with a new name. A third contributing factor was that Atari, the leader of the industry, wasn't seriously looking at the next generation of game consoles to debut once the 2600 had reached its end of life. Atari did release the 5200, but that thing was riddled with issues that just come with the territory of quickly getting an upgrade game system out to market. The companies actually trying to develop more state-of-the-art systems ran into financial restraints due to just not being Atari. Many people point towards the game E.T. as the root cause of the crash. As I already covered in a prior video, which features an interview with Howard Scott Warshaw, the former Atari programmer who actually designed and coded the infamous E.T. game, it was not a cause of the crash, but merely a symptom of it. When Atari released E.T. in late 1982, they had ordered 5 million units to be produced. Comparing E.T. to other games, Atari produced 12 million cartridges for Pac-Man, but only sold 7.7 .7 million of them. That left over 4 million unsold Pac-Man cartridges in their inventory. Statistically, while Pac-Man sold more units than any other Atari game, E.T. still remains one of the best-selling games with 1.5 million units sold. 
Now, many of those sold got returned, and even if no one had returned them, Atari would have still been left with millions of unsold cartridges. But why is that? Because to recoup the $21 million paid for the rights to E.T., Atari ordered so many to be produced. What happened with these unsold cartridges, as well as other random Atari surplus, was they eventually just buried them in a landfill in New Mexico. For decades, this was just considered an urban legend. But in 2012, those cartridges were unearthed, exposing the truth, that they were in fact buried in the desert. So, did E.T. cause the video game crash? No! But it didn't help either. Producing far more games than needed proved fatal for them. Despite the gaming market crashing, Atari kept the 2600 console available through retail until early 1992, although I suspect they didn't sell as many as they hoped to that late. By the time it was discontinued, Atari had sold over 30 million 2600 consoles. They did release a next generation console in 1982 in the form of the 5200, but this next generation console was literally just an Atari 400 and 800 inside a new casing. It did have 16 kilobytes of RAM compared to the 8 kilobytes sported in the 2600. Despite selling over a million units, in the end, the 5200 was lackluster at best. By 1984, many analysts believed video games were just a fad that was now coming to a close. But that little-known, aggressive Japanese card game company was further expanding their role beyond just developing arcade games like Donkey Kong. They would soon release to the West a version of their recently successful Famicom system. And at the helm of this Western expansion would be none other than former outside legal counsel Howard Lincoln, who took a role as senior vice president and general counsel at Nintendo of America. A decade later, in 1994, Lincoln would step up as chairman of the board until his retirement in 2016. Hiroshi Yamamuchi continued to lead Nintendo into prosperous times until his retirement in 2002. Although towards the end of his career, Nintendo began struggling in the midst of competitors like Sony and Microsoft. Hiroshi died in 2013 at age 85. In 1984, Warner Communications sold the home computer and console division of Atari to Jack Trammell. Warner kept the coin operating side and renamed it Atari Corporation. It would eventually get renamed Tengen and ended up releasing numerous unauthorized Nintendo games after illegally obtaining the patent information on Nintendo's lockout chip. After losing numerous lawsuits against Nintendo, Tengen was engulfed in the Time Warner family. Like other things I've covered before, Tengen was also discussed in much more detail in an earlier episode. It's hard to summarize the impact all these people and all these companies had on the gaming market. Many times, their success is transmitted over into other industries, offering technology and ideas not previously seen before. Other times, technology and ideas transmit back over to the gaming industry. This technology has served both as entertainment and as a training tool for numerous industries around the world. Countless people have influenced the growth and fall of this technology over the years. I've always been fascinated by the technology itself and how it works and why it works. History tends to repeat itself in one form or another. Knowing this history may not keep it from repeating, but it might just give some insight on what's going to happen next. Well, that is it for this episode of The Bearded Nerd. Thanks for watching. Be sure to click the thumbs up if you liked the video and to subscribe to keep up with future videos. See you next time. Lana. 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 Lana! What? <laughs> Danger zone.